Welcome to Stonebridge Online. Just before we start the service, here are some announcements and things to know. During this time of worshiping online, it's important to continue contributing to the ongoing ministry of Stonebridge. Here are the ways in which you can give. You can give online through our website at stonebridgecme.com, click on online giving. You can give through your bank's bill pay option, or you can give by mail. If you'd like offering envelopes sent to you, please contact the church office. The Community Christmas Shop will take place at Simi Covenant on Saturday, December 12th. Due to the pandemic, the Christmas Shop will be a drive through event. There are many ways to volunteer, including toy donation, hosting toy collection, and serving on the day of the event. Sign-ups are required. One way our church family celebrates the holy season is through our special Heart of Christmas offering. The Heart of Christmas offering is divided between five important ministries that make a difference all year long. Action, Impact, Front Porch Ministries, New Church Development, and the Christmas Joy Offering. For more information on each of these ministries and to make a donation, please visit our website, click on Resources. Join us for Christmas Eve on the front lawn at Stonebridge. We will have two service times to choose from, 2.30 or 4 o'clock. Registration is required. For those events that require registration, or for any details you might have missed, please check your newsletter or visit our website. And lastly, we would love to know that you're participating in worship. Continue to share your news, prayers, and praises by emailing prayers at stonebridgecme.com. Or if you're following along in version, please take the time to fill out the e-connection card. You are an important part of Stonebridge's community of faith. Once again, welcome to worship. Hi, Stonebridge, and welcome to worship. My name is Stephanie Leedy, Director of Children's and Family Ministries. In September, my husband Jason and I welcomed Caleb here to our family, and after a wonderful maternity leave, I am so happy to be back with you all. This week in worship, Pastor John will be talking about faithfulness and exploring Jesus's model of faith. We are so glad you're here. Welcome to worship.
Today's scripture comes from Isaiah chapter 7, verses 10 through 17. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David. Is it too little for you to weary mortals, that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son, and shall name him Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. The Lord will bring on you and on your people and on your ancestral house such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. This is the word of the Lord. Hello, Stonebridge. I am Pastor John, one of the pastors here at Stonebridge Community Church, and it is good to be with you. 
looking at the scriptures and worshiping this weekend. We are continuing our sermon series entitled Anointed, where we are looking at the different passages in the book of Isaiah that shaped and formed the hopes and expectations for a Messiah. The passages that helped the people of God know what to look for and to be excited about and to have anticipation for. Because we know that on Christmas we will celebrate the birth of Jesus, who we proclaim to be the Messiah. So I invite you, as we turn to these scriptures, as we look to answer this question of why was Jesus sent? Why is it important that Jesus is the Messiah? I invite you to join with me in prayer, asking that God would open us up to the scriptures. Please pray with me. Lord, as we turn to the book of Isaiah, I ask that you would open up our minds, open up our hearts, open up our eyes and ears so that we can understand you better. So we can understand why Jesus was sent better. So we can place our hope and faith in Jesus. So please speak to us now through your scriptures and through your Holy Spirit. We ask this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, I wish I could have been there in person when I saw the scripture passage being read to all of you. Because I'm sure that there were all sorts of different responses. This passage, taken out of context and just read on its own, it can seem a little bit confusing. Now, I'm sure there's some of you who are used to this passage. You're familiar with it. You know what it is. You've studied the background. You've studied the history. And, and to you, it seems very normal. Others of you, though, I'm sure, heard this passage be read and you were confused. That's okay. It's okay to be confused by what the Bible says. That confusion it just creates more of an opportunity to learn and to grow. And none of us comes to the Bible with all of the answers. So if you felt confused, I just want to encourage you in that. That's an okay place to be. That's why we have things like sermons. And that's why when growth groups come, we talk about the scriptures together in community. Others of you, though, I'm sure, you heard the passage being read. It felt confusing. But then Olivia got to that part that says, the woman shall give birth to a child, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And that felt familiar to you. There's a reason it feels familiar to you. It's because that's one of the passages that we turn to around Christmas time every year. Because the Gospel of Matthew quotes Isaiah 7, the passage that Olivia read. In talking about the birth of Jesus as the Messiah, Matthew quotes Isaiah 7. One of the things that we're trying to do in this sermon series is to take these prophecies that Jesus fulfills and dig a little deeper and understand more than just that these prophecies are a checklist to mark off, but there's usually some sort of significance to the passages also. So this passage in Isaiah 7, it can be confusing but it's also important because I believe there's more than just a checklist going on here. I think this is important for us to understand one of the things that Matthew, the writer of the Gospel of Matthew, and the early Christians are trying to tell us about Jesus as the Messiah. But in order to understand why it's important, I think we have to jump back and look at this story in Isaiah 7. And really look at the main character in this story. In Isaiah 7, the main character is a young man named Ahaz. Ahaz is a king. Ahaz is the king over the people of God. So the people that God has a covenant with, the people residing in Jerusalem and the surrounding area, Ahaz is their king. And Ahaz rules over them. But from other parts of the Bible, and we can see it in this passage as well, Ahaz turns out to be not a very great king. In fact, the Bible refers to him as evil or as wicked. He starts worshiping foreign gods. He abandons the God of the Bible. And he's not lifted up as a hero of faith. In fact, he's lifted up as the opposite. But here in Isaiah 7, Ahaz is at the beginning of his 
reign as king. In fact, here in Isaiah 7, Ahaz is probably only about 20 years old. He's pretty young. Now, I think back to what I was dealing with when I was 20 years old, and I have a lot of pity for Ahaz. For those of you who are older than 20, you can think back to where you were at 20 and realize this guy was in a pretty tough spot. When I tell you the whole situation, you'll understand that. For those of you who are hoping to be 20 and who are younger than 20 now and looking forward to being 20 someday, um, just imagine that when I tell you Ahaz's story that this is what you're going to be dealing with and imagine how difficult that might be. So Ahaz has just become king at age 20. And nearly immediately, he has a crisis. He has a threat, not just to his reign, but to his people. Because over on the horizon, there is an empire forming. There's an empire on the march. A strong, mighty army is expanding it's the nation of Assyria, the empire of Assyria, and Assyria is expanding its borders. And while it does so, it's destroying cities and towns and any who might want to oppose the empire and not become subservient to the empire of Assyria, Assyria's military destroys. So Ahaz has that threat looming. But surprisingly enough, that's not even the biggest threat that Ahaz has. Because more immediately, Ahaz has two neighboring nations, not Assyria, two others, that want to fight against Assyria. And what they've done is they've set up camp around the city of Jerusalem. They've besieged Ahaz's city. And they've said to Ahaz, either you and your army join us against Assyria, or we're just going to come in and destroy you now. So Ahaz has these two nations telling him, join us against Assyria, or we're going to destroy you and your city. And he has Assyria out there waiting for that threat as well. And he's 20 years old, and he just became king. This is not an easy situation. This is a very difficult situation. And I actually think if I were in Ahaz's shoes when I was 20, I would have totally messed this whole situation up. He's in a very difficult spot here. And I don't know what I would do in Ahaz's position, really. I don't think any of us really does. But I think we can know what Ahaz should do. We can also know what the people of God were hoping Ahaz would do because of the prophet Isaiah, because of this passage here. The prophet Isaiah, sent by God to Ahaz, delivers a message to Ahaz and says, don't get involved in these foreign alliances. Don't team up with these two kings. Don't team up with Assyria. Stay out of this one. And actually, right before the passage Olivia read, Isaiah says to Ahaz, either you must stand in faith or you will not stand at all. Isaiah's message to Ahaz is have faith. Don't place your faith in other kings and in military power. Don't place your faith in the might of the weapons that you have here or the weapons of other countries and other kings and nations. But place your faith in God and God alone. That's Isaiah's message. We know, though, that Ahaz doesn't listen. And I wish we could have seen what the alternate story would have been if Ahaz had taken Isaiah's advice. I wish we could have seen how this played out, but we don't get to see that. We know that Ahaz doesn't place his faith in God. In fact, in the passage Olivia read, Isaiah says to Ahaz, look, if you don't believe me, ask God for a sign. Ask God to confirm what I'm saying. That's what Isaiah is saying there when he says, ask the Lord your God for a sign, but Ahaz won't even do that. 
Ahaz dismisses Isaiah's message. And he ends up getting entangled in all of these foreign alliances. And there's bad consequences, as the Bible tells us. Ahaz ends up not standing in faith. But as Isaiah goes along, Isaiah stops addressing Ahaz directly. And he gives this promise. This promise for a child to be born. And it's in contrast to Ahaz, this child. Whereas Ahaz doesn't have faith. This child is going to have wisdom and faith and going to know how to choose right from wrong. This child is going to be the opposite of Ahaz. You could see how this promise that Isaiah gives, that it grows and it develops and it becomes something greater than just the promise for a, a king right then. As the centuries progress, this promise that Isaiah gives of this child, the promise grows, takes on a life of its own. So the people of God, they hope for a faithful king, a faithful leader, someone who, unlike Ahaz, will have faith in God. And this, I believe, is one of the aspects that's hoped for from the Messiah, that when the Messiah arrives, the Messiah is going to have pure faith in God, great faith in God, deep faith in God. It's easy for us, as we're talking about this, to just demonize Ahaz, though, because the Bible kind of does that. So it's easy for us to do that, and it's okay for us to do that, because Ahaz does make the wrong choice here. But before we just jump to demonizing Ahaz, I think we all have to acknowledge that we have a little bit of Ahaz in ourselves as well. Faith is not easy. There are some of you, I'm sure, you have the spiritual gift of faith, and it does come easy to you. But there are others of us where faith isn't easy. I think particularly in our world today, faith isn't easy. There's all sorts of tragedies that take place that can shake our faith. Personal tragedies, national tragedies, worldwide tragedies. So many people who are raised in the church have walked away from faith because of the suffering and the tragedy they see in the world. And then there's all sorts of new discoveries, scientific discoveries, historical discoveries, archaeological discoveries that can start to shake in our understanding of faith. That can start to, from our perspective, weaken our faith. Faith is not always easy. So when we look at Ahaz's story and we see him being terrified of these kings, and we see his faith wavering, and then we see him abandoning his faith, before we just demonize him, we have to acknowledge that we all have a piece of that. Our faith in God wavers and we start looking to other things to strengthen it. It's probably not foreign alliances for most of us because I don't think most of us are 20-year-old kings. Um, if you are, Email me. I'd love to hear your story. Um, but it's other things that we turn to and look to. Sometimes we can think that our faith is under attack from people who disagree with us. So we start turning to uh, arguments, philosophical discussion. We start placing our faith in our ability to argue for faith rather than placing our faith actually in Jesus. We think that if we can prove faith, that somehow our doubts will go away, our insecurities, our uncertainties will go away, that the ambiguities of life will go away. And we miss the fact that we're actually misplacing our faith. Faith, it's not always easy. But that's why the Messiah is so important. The way the New Testament talks about Jesus as the Messiah is that Jesus, he strengthens our faith. 
in at least a couple of different ways Jesus strengthens our faith. First, Jesus strengthens our faith because he is a model of faith. He is that leader, that Messiah who was anointed to have faith. We know, historically speaking, we don't even need to read the scriptures for this, we know that Jesus existed. There's a few people who doubt that, but it's silliness. There's so much overwhelming evidence from just history that Jesus did exist. And we know that Jesus died for what he was proclaiming. Those are very solid historical facts that we can rest in. When you look at scripture, you see that Jesus proclaimed what he proclaimed because he had faith in God. Jesus was willing to go to the cross and die because he had faith in God. Jesus' faith, it's a model for us. When a group is wavering in their faithfulness, when a people aren't sure if they should move forward into a risky situation, the leader's faith can be what rallies them, what encourages them, what strengthens them. And that's one of the ways that Jesus strengthens our faith. Because whatever doubts we might have, whatever possibilities might come that might harm us, Jesus has overcome worse. And Jesus' faith took him through worse. Because Jesus went to the cross and he was willing to do so because his faith in God was so complete, so absolute, and so perfect. That faith can encourage us as well when we start to experience doubts and uncertainties. But there's a second way that the New Testament talks about Jesus strengthening our faith. And it's a little bit deeper, actually. Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, directly strengthens our faith. His faith becomes ours over time. Somehow, in some way that I can't entirely explain, the Bible tells us Jesus strengthens and sustains our faith through the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus stands in for us so that when our faith is wavering, Jesus' faith actually carries us. And I have to say, thank God for that. Because I can't strengthen my own faith enough. I am somebody who doubts. I am somebody who struggles with questions. My faith left to its own devices, and if I just tried to rest in my own arguments, it would falter. It would fail. But Jesus' faith is perfect. He is the Messiah anointed to strengthen our faith, and he does so. And because of that, we can place our faith in God. Because Jesus, our Messiah, strengthens it. So A has a story here in Isaiah 7. It's a cautionary tale. It shows us what wavering faith looks like and what faith abandoned looks like and the results of it. Ahaz goes down in history as an evil king. But we can rest in the faith of the Messiah. We can rest in Jesus' faith so that Ahaz's story doesn't become ours. And we can trust that when doubts arrive, when uncertainty creeps in, we don't have to be afraid of them. We don't have to just dismiss doubts, dismiss questions. We can trust that if Jesus' faith can sustain the cross and survive the cross, it can survive whatever doubts we have, whatever questions we have. And by resting in the Messiah's faith, our own faith is strengthened and grows and is deeper. So in this season, may you rest in the faith of our Lord Jesus, and may his faith sustain you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. At this time in worship, we're going to enter into a time of personal prayer and conclude together with the Lord's Prayer. In this week's Advent message, Pastor John addressed the topic of faith so that as believers, we would be strengthened. What is faith? The book of Hebrews describes faith as confidence in what we hope for and assurance in what we do not see. Faith is completely trusting in the unseen God. Faith knows that God loves us completely. Faith knows that through the death and resurrection, Jesus paid the penalty for our failures. 
Faith believes the word of God is all we need to know how to live a blessed life. Sadly, there are times when our faith wanes. Circumstances feel too difficult. Our hope grows small. Our belief in what is unseen withers. Like the father of the demon-possessed son in Mark chapter 9, we all need help with our faith sometimes. He prayed, I believe. Help me in my unbelief. Does your faith need strengthening? When we need more faith, like the Father in Mark chapter 9, we can ask for more. We can boldly go before the Father of our faith and ask for our faith to be strengthened. Perhaps this resonates with you, or perhaps someone you know, someone you love is struggling in their faith. Take a moment now to pray for your own faith. Take a moment now to pray for those you know and love who need their faith strengthened. Let's pray. And we conclude by praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Trust what you 
say that you're good, your love is great. Stonebridge, as you go wherever it is God may call you, may you go knowing that Jesus strengthens your faith, and may you go with the faith of our Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. May you go with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the love of the Father. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen. Great and sad.